Rosie Jane Armour Trading. It's 20 to 6 tomorrow night down at the pub. It won't just be students getting a Tuesday beer, but there'll be professors there as well. It's part of the Profs and Pints series of talks. And this week they'll be discussing whether science fiction is good for science fact. Renee Sayer is the organiser of the event. She's with us this afternoon. Hi, Renee. Oh, hello. And also Dr Alan Duffy is an astrophysicist who will be there as well. He's in the studio with us too. Hello, Alan. Thanks a lot. Good Good to to see you, mate. Nice to have you here. I just love this idea because it's taking science to the people. I mean, that must be the key. Absolutely. Um, we, we're always looking at ways to engage um, the public and particularly adult audiences. Um, so the whole idea behind Profs and Pints was just to get some contentious and contemporary science issues, get a couple of um, profs together, whether that's professional people in industry or um, academics, professors, and just get them talking in a pub, get the audience in and get a really good banter going on. And, and so actually, how does it work tomorrow night? What, you know, when people turn up, what would they see? Yep, it's very similar to Q&A, um, uh, also on ABC. So we're trying to just encourage a dialogue between um, the panel um, and, and the audience. So the, the panel uh, this evening, uh, tomorrow evening, excuse me, we've got Dr Alan Duffy, um, we've got Grant Stone and we've got uh, IONET Top Geek uh, PRK and they will be sitting up the front uh, <laughs> with myself um, and they They'll give 10 minutes spiel, um, their kind of take on the topic and looking at um, does it inspire or does it raise unrealistic expectations. They'll talk for 10 minutes apiece and then we throw it open to the floor for um, a big Q&A session where we hash out all sorts of interesting ideas. Yeah, hopefully fueled by some beer. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And yes. fuel it along. Don't, let's fuel not it along. Today, it's, it's really informal. It, it, it's yeah. just kicking back, having a chat. We're just trying to take those discussions that you would have normally in the pub, bit of banter with your mates, um, but bringing science along the way and having a say. Uh, Alan, what about you? Were a scientist, but were you a science fiction, or are you a science fiction fan? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, most of us, uh, we work at the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. Um, we're all huge sci-fi fans. You just, you know, <laughs> Star Trek, Star Wars. Um, it inspired us all to, to go into science, I think. But um, I think that this topic tomorrow is actually kind of fun. It's it's not clear that, in my mind at least, that a lot of the sci-fi that I grew up that inspired me to go in has really given uh, science a, a good name, this this kind of expectation that, you know, science will always come up with a, a solution to an immediate, apparent, dangerous situation. A few heroes are going to save the day, you know, slap together some some high tech solution in twelve days. I'm basically thinking <laughs> the Bruce Willis effect of Armageddon. Uh, I just don't know that that's uh, that's too helpful for science. So I think I'm going to take a contentious stance on this. Actually, uh, what, what about then in your job as an astrophysicist? Is there anything that you see, you know, in the office that was uh, twenty years ago <laughs> science fiction? Uh, yeah, I mean, you well. Global Positioning Satellites, right, GPS. This was actually um, proposed by Arthur C. Clarke, famous British uh, sci-fi writer, many, many years ago and has now become a reality, a daily uh, reality for us all. We actually just had a launch last week, um, or sorry, well, a few days ago, of uh, a Russian satellite that's now going way past the orbit of the Earth and is going to be seen, uh, is going to connect with Earth-based telescopes. And you'll get this now, you know, a telescope, an effective telescope bigger than essentially the orbits of the moon. I mean, this, these are the kind of crazy ideas that uh, were first proposed in science fiction that have now become science fact. So that's, that's pretty exciting times. You would think, wouldn't you, Renee, that most scientists are attracted to science fiction. I mean, it just mm. sort of makes sense to me that you, you grew yeah. up loving Absolutely. those shows on television. Absolutely. And, and that they would be inspire. You know, wouldn't you think, too, that, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to try and make space travel affordable or, you know, an everyday occurrence mm. sort of thing. And I think it's also people looking above and beyond the, the, the current situation for problems that are maybe sometimes hard to tackle or um, for problems that there's not solutions for yet. I think that's why sci-fi is really important and the culture of sci-fi is really important to a lot of people because it is a source of inspiration. We are looking above and beyond and um, these capabilities do push us in, in finding the next frontier, the final frontier or <laughs> what, whatever that may be. So um, it's, it's, it's really exciting and I, I, there is a lot, though, um, out there that, um, effectively you have to wade through before you get to the good stuff and the good stuff um, that 
actually inspires in the right way rather than the wrong way and setting up false expectations or generating misconceptions and this proliferation of misinformation through um, through these different types of cultures and domains. But, you know, that's what we'll be talking about. <laughs> Let me tell you that we put it to our listeners. Which fictional invention would you like to see made real? Which this is probably <laughs> now just adding fuel to that fire and lifting, lifting unreal expectations. Where's my hovercraft? Well, yes, the hovercraft is in there. Uh, the the hoverboard. Hoverboard, that's what I meant, hover. sorry. Back to the future. Yeah. Classic, still waiting on it. Mm. Uh, they did try one recently. I'm sure I saw something that was like attempting to have a go at it. Somebody said the backpack jet thingy, but I know that you can actually get those. <laughs> Absolutely. They've got all it's sorts about of different... 30 seconds long, I think. Yeah, yeah. prototypes. Yeah. And... I spoke to a Frenchman who actually went over the, the Grand Canyon. Whoa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably uh, two months ago, and it's in one. It was, and we spoke to somebody else that did uh, that did one, but the, the pack was huge. Yeah, the Frenchman was like the one that you dream about. Wow! Sort of That's strap true. it on, a couple of handles. Did he say how much the the, the prototype cost? He him did. He did. Don't ask me. <laughs> I can't remember. A few more years. I was just away. I, once he said yes. I've done it. It works and everything. I just I don't know what else I asked him after that. I was just dreaming. <laughs> um, a time machine. Oh. Yeah. Tell you know. me about it. That would be fantastic. Just, I mean, even just – it doesn't have to be for, for too much crazy in the future. Sometimes you just want to redo things that you did last week. Oh, that would be quite nice. Just to take your foot out of your mouth. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe not have that extra pint. Right. <laughs> just something like that. <laughs> um, and, in fact, talking about pint, an everlasting pint oh. was yeah. somebody else's. A teleporter. Like in Star Trek. Oh, I mean, that's – Well, we're getting there. Else, we are, yeah. you know, we can teleport atoms – of that size. So, you know, yeah. there's only a few trillion, trillion, trillion more and you've got a person. So we're getting there. So feasibly we could, you know, get somebody to stand on that spot over there and then mm. and pop them out somewhere else. Absolutely. You do have to destroy the sample, though. That I is a disadvantage, yeah. Uh, yeah. For that to happen, theoretically, you essentially are destroying sample A, which is you, and then <laughs> sample B, which yeah. is the, the new you that has been transported, is actually not you. So you don't really want... The uh, computer software running this to be Windows, say, and have a have a big crash. That, that might not be great. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the time traveling DeLorean. I mean, everyone would everyone would want that. Absolutely. Um, I just sell for a DeLorean. Yeah. Just, just, <laughs> a flying car. That, that's more feasible than most of the ones. This yeah. is beautiful. This is from Murray. He says, "I want my flying car." The Jetsons promised that we'd have it by now. Yes. Yes. Well, this is one of the things that sci-fi does raise the bar on our expectations of what we think, and I mean. Even you look back, um, I believe NASA had said that they were going to get men on Mars by 2000, back in the 70s, and it's, I mean, we're, we're looking a long way in the future before we can really feasibly get people in space for that long. So um, it definitely is an issue. People expect great things from science, and um, I suppose sci-fi does have a lot to answer for in those respects. Mm -hmm. Renee Sayers with me and Dr Alan Duffy, and they will be together with others tomorrow night for Profs and Pints. It's at the Flying Scotsman in the Velvet Lounge. Yes. Which is the, the little room down the back on the on the ground floor. Absolutely. And uh, it starts at 6 o'clock. But I will say 5.30, get the doors open, 5.30. Um, we're expecting peeps around, so make sure you grab a seat. <laughs> you said peeps? Peeps, lots of peeps. Yeah. Peeps and tweets because <laughs> we are uh, Twitter. We have a Twitter full running and we have a hashtag, hashtag Profs and Pints, um, so we can get the dialogue online as well as in the room. I love it. I love the idea. Well, what about for each of you? Um, Talking about real expectations, what do you what do you see as being like a, a next significant advancement? Oh, I, I I'm not sure. Um, oh, the next advancement in, in in what field? In in astronomy? In, well, well any field, preferably something I'll, that we've I'll seen. Handle yeah. I'll handle yeah. the astronomy. I'll handle over to. I think uh, for me personally. In 2012, February 29th, 2012, we get the site decision on the Sky. world's largest, yeah, that's right, the world's largest upcoming telescope, South Africa or Australia. So we this could have it built. But yeah. this is Perth we're talking about and Australia. Uh, but we need to develop this into some sort of like sporting, like a, <laughs> a sporting event that people, you know, like an America's Cup of Science this is, Australia versus South Africa. And it's not that we dislike South Africans or anything like that, but the fact of the matter is is that there is a chance for us to get this square kilometre array here or it will go to South Africa. Mm. It will mean significant employment opportunities as far as research yeah. operations. Yep. It will put Perth on the scientific map globally. Absolutely. Um, so we, many, many I mean, billions of dollars we, are at stake here. What is it, February the what? Uh, February the 29th. 
of the 2012. There's the, I know, we're all very nervous at the centre. Isn't it fantastic that it's on the 29th of Feb? It just works nicely. It does. It's very, very cool. Um, very, what about cool. for you, Renee? Is there something that you, you think might happen in any field? Oh, goodness me. Um, I think the way in which we're using 3D and virtual realities to actually solve and work in real-world problems, I know in um, they can map um, mine shafts and you can actually go go in into a 3D sort of room and essentially virtually turn things on and off like deep underground and I, I don't know whether that's going to be you know pushed forward to being able to do that on other planets or um, just in general kind of reaching areas that are really remote and we can't actually be there in space and time but maybe um, <laughs> maybe in our virtual worlds we can make it happen I'm not sure but one thing we're definitely exploring at uh, SciTech next year our new exhibition um, that will be launching in a year's time um is science fiction, science future. So we're actually going to be exploring all these different ideas and, you know, uh, has it uh, all these things that have been imagined by sci-fi writers across the, the ages, you know, have they become reality? So some of the things that we're looking at... Um, you know, we'll try and get get you to ride a hovercraft and you know play a laser guitar and all sorts of all sorts of different things. So um, yeah, I don't know. There's, uh, I just sometimes sometimes you just you never know what's on the other side of the horizon. I think that's what's so exciting. It's true. The the world's moving so quickly, isn't it? It is advancing so quickly. Um, Alan, Renee, thanks for coming in. Have a good night tomorrow night. Thank thanks you. So hope to see us. you there. Get down at half past five. I'll have to get down. Absolutely. You know, I'll have to clock off early. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. be sick tomorrow and oh, then I'll come along and enjoy it. <laughs> also, I um, just wanted to quickly say that IONET is sponsoring the event and they've got some goodie bags for the first 50, 50 um, people ABC on the board. Radio. Sorry? ABC. <laughs> and ABC. ABC. No, no. Oh, okay. not you can't do sponsors. Yeah, sponsors, advertising. <laughs> oh, really? I'm yeah. so sorry. That's all right. Um, did, you, did you cut me? No. Oh. You We're still on? swear it's not too bad. I'm so very sorry. Yeah, no, that's Are we fine. still on? Are we, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Oh. Yeah, don't mention them again. <laughs> um, okay, have a anyway. great time. Props and pints. I think so you two are proof that it's going to be a good night. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Renee. Uh, it is 826 on Drive. Drive with Russell Wolfe.